Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and get started now. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Matt Johnson and I am the project manager uh, with the Montgomery County Department of Transportation. Uh, and we're here to talk tonight about the Fenton Street Bikeway study. Um, before we really get into things, um, I just want to go over some basics to help you use the format. I'm sure most of you have been using Zoom over the past couple of uh, months, but in case you're new to this platform, we just want to go over a couple of uh, uh, quick guidelines. Um, I also do need to note that this meeting is being recorded and a recording of this meeting will be posted to uh, the website um, in a few days once we've had a chance to get it captioned. So if you don't wish to have your your voice recorded, um, please do not speak during the meeting. We can, we're certainly happy to um, pass on any comments that you have. If you want to send those via the chat feature, we can, we can read those out loud for you if you don't want your voice to be recorded. We're also asking people um, not to turn your cameras on in order to, to reduce the bandwidth. Um, you're all muted and you do not have the ability to unmute yourself. Um, we can unmute you um, during the question and answer and comment period. Would like to request to speak you will need to raise your hand and we're going to tell you how to do that in just a moment um, once we unmute you you may still need to confirm that you want to be unmuted just that we can't unmute you without your consent um, if you've called in using a telephone you will unmute yourself by dialing star six um, the um, as i said your video camera is off by default we would like to reduce the bandwidth um, for this meeting so please leave your camera off unless you're a member of the staff or consultants um if you would like to ask a question you can use the chat feature the way you do that um you can see here a, an example of a, of a presentation window here if you click the chat button at the bottom of your screen a new window will pop up you can select um who you want to send it to and to because i'm going to be running the meeting i won't be able to respond to chat so if you send the chat to me during the meeting i will not see it so if you have a question um, or you'd like a comment read out on your behalf, please select Corey Pitts in that drop down box and send it to Corey. Corey will be handling those kinds of questions during the meeting. Uh, if you'd like to raise your hand, the way you do that is by clicking the participants button, which also will be at the bottom of your screen, um, and then click raise hand. And depending on which version of Zoom you have, it may be a little bit different for you. Um, but click the raise hand button and that will let us know that you have a question and would like to speak. Um, also, you may, be, depending on how your Zoom format looks, you may be seeing a bunch of black squares with initials in them, people who have their cameras turned off. If you would like to change that, you can click, don't click start video, but click the little up arrow next to start video, and then click video settings, and then you can make sure that the hide non-video participants uh, is checked. That will hide all those blank boxes where people have their cameras turned off. Um, again, uh, my name is Matt Johnson. Uh, I'm the project manager with the Montgomery County Department of Transportation, um, and this is my contact information. You will see it again at the end of the meeting, so you don't need to write it down right this minute, but um, we are all working from home for the most part, so I would strongly encourage you to, uh, if you'd like to reach out to me, to uh, send me an email rather than trying to call me uh, on my desk phone. Uh, I just want to go over what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, we have we kind of we're running a little bit ahead of schedule, which is good because it means we have a little bit more time for public comment at the end. Uh, but we're going to start off with introductions in just a minute, and then we're going to go into the meeting presentation. Following that, we'll have public comment, and the meeting is officially scheduled to end at nine. If we have a lot of comments and people still uh, haven't spoken at nine, we can stay a little bit later uh, if necessary. Um, so again, my name is Matt Johnson. Uh, also with me um, today uh, from the Montgomery County Department of Transportation, we do have um, several staff members. Um, I wanna make sure I try and get everybody. Um, we do have Director Chris Conklin with us uh, this evening, um, Director of the MCDOT. Uh, we also have the uh, Division Chief for the Division of Transportation Engineering, uh, Tim Couples, and the Division Chief for the uh, Division of Traffic Engineering and Operations, Michael Paler. Um, Corey Pitts is the planning manager. Uh, he's here with us. Um, so again, Sarafi is uh, the, the deputy chief of the uh, Division of Transportation Engineering. And Pat Shepard, uh, the bikeways coordinator, is also here. Um, from our consulting team, uh, and you can see most of their faces, we have uh, Robert Milstead, Dave Merrihue, uh, Steve Zinder, and Lori Adgate. They're here with Stantec. They're our consultants on this project. We also have 
uh, from the uh, Montgomery County Planning Department. We have uh, Katie Mancarini and Eli Glazier here. And we have from the Silver Spring Regional Services Center, uh, Roberto Rodriguez. Thank you for joining us, Roberto. I think I got everyone here from the consultant team and the staff, and I apologize if I missed anyone. Um, so uh, we're gonna go into the presentation now. Um, and again, if anyone has any questions, uh, clarifying questions during the presentation, please send those to Corey Pitts and he will break in if, if he thinks it's uh, warranted to get a clarifying question in. Otherwise, hold your questions and comments until the end. Um, so the goals of the meeting tonight, uh, we are going to first give you an update on the Fenton Street, Maryland 410 intersection project. Um, sounds like someone just messaged me to say that my, the sound quality is not very good. Let me see if I can get a little closer to my monitor here. Um, so we're going to start by giving a presentation, an update on the uh, Maryland 410 Fenton Street intersection project. Uh, following that, we're going to talk about the Fenton Street bikeway study um, and introduce the alternatives that uh, came out of that study. And we also want to get your feedback about um, the, uh, the study and the alternatives. So the end of the meeting will be uh, for public comment. Just to get everyone oriented to the um, to the project area, we this is a map of Silver Spring here. Up north is uh, is up in this image. Uh, you can see the metro station, the transit center is right here. Um, the Safeway and the Whole Foods are here. Just to get you oriented, the Fenton Street Bikeway study is shown in orange on the map, and it runs down Fenton Street from Cameron Street in the north down to Gist Avenue in the south, and immediately south of those project limits. Uh, are the limits for the Fenton Street, Maryland 410 intersection project uh, that starts at Gist Avenue and it goes down Fenton Street to King Street. And it also extends about a half a block in either direction on Maryland 410, which is uh, Burlington Avenue and Philadelphia Avenue. Um, so I kind of give an outline of the whole overall meeting. The presentation, we're going to start with the Fenton, Maryland 410 project. We're going to talk about the background and result of the bikeway study next. Uh, section three, we'll go over the alternatives in brief, and then section four, we'll talk about the next steps before we go into the public comment period. Um, this project, the Maryland 410 Fenton Street intersection project, uh, the goal of this project is to redesign the intersection between Fenton Street and Burlington Avenue and Philadelphia Avenue. Um, the primary goals of this project are to improve bicyclist and pedestrian safety, and a secondary goal is to reduce the amount of impervious surface in the intersection. Um, so in terms of why we are looking at redesigning this intersection, um, we know that speed is one of the most critical factors in crash survivability. So if you're a pedestrian or a bicyclist and you're hit by a driver, the faster that driver is going, the more likely that crash is to be uh, fatal or severe. Um, this is an urban area. We have a lot of pedestrian and bicyclist activity here on the edge of the Silver Spring CBD. And these high speed right turn ramps really are incompatible with the urban environment. And the reason that these are, are like they are, um, if we go back in history a little bit, um, Fenton Street used to come from the north, it used to end at Sligo Avenue. And in 1960, Fenton Street was extended from Sligo Avenue down to this intersection. And before Fenton Street was extended, this was a five-way intersection. You can kind of see the five legs here. So this, this leg used to be called Woodbury Drive, which this leg still is. Um, Philadelphia Avenue went straight across, as you can see, which is why Philadelphia Avenue is discontinuous. And Burlington Avenue came in from the west. And there was a roundabout in the middle. So in 1960, when Fenton Street was extended, the... Sorry, it looks like we had a little sound issue there. The, uh, the northern leg uh, was, was cut off all of Philadelphia Avenue and the Woodbury leg uh, on the north end was cut off. And we had all this extra right of way. So these high speed right turn ramps were installed, but they really uh, don't fit in with the urban character of, of downtown Silver Spring. So, um, oops, sorry, went too far. Uh, let me go back here. All right, here we go. Um, so you saw this, this plan, and I should point out for orientation purposes that this plan is rotated 90 degrees. Uh, for, uh, clockwise from the previous image. The north is in, on the right side of your screen here, just for your reference. Georgia Avenue is, is running left to right off the top of the map. Um, Montgomery College will be to the left. Downtown Silver Spring will be up to the right. 
Um, so this is Maryland 410, Philadelphia Avenue, Burlington Avenue here running up and down on your screen. And this concept was what we called the hybrid concept back at our meeting in January of 2020, earlier this year. Uh, what we're proposing here is to, and I should point out also, we have the Metropolitan Branch Trail here shown in green. Uh, this section of the Metropolitan Branch Trail already exists. Um, it runs from the DC border up to uh, the end of King Street here, just off the map. We are currently working to extend it to the Silver Spring Transit Center, where it will then continue to Bethesda as the Capitol Crescent Trail. And DC is working on extending its piece from Union Station to the Maryland border. So this piece of the trail, uh, uh, the, this uh, shared use pathway that we're talking about will extend, be, essentially be a spur of the Metropolitan Branch Trail that comes up to Maryland 410 and continues north of Maryland 410 as a separated bike lane with a sidewalk next to it um, for two blocks up to Gist Avenue. Um, we're also, you can see we're moving the uh, high speed right turn ramps here to reduce the impervious surface in the intersection and expand the park space here. We are working with the Montgomery County Parks Department to uh, expand this park. And we're proposing to add a median refuge here at Gist Avenue to make pedestrian crossings of Trenton Street uh, easier and safer. Now, this is intended to be a project with independent utility, meaning we could build this without building the rest of Fenton Street uh, as a cycle track um, or before it, before the rest of it happens. Um, and the idea is if this is built before the Fenton Street uh, cycle track is built through Fenton Village, uh, we need to have some kind of crossover so that northbound cyclists can transit from, from the trail and cycle track into northbound traffic. So we're proposing an interim crossover like this using this median refuge so the northbound cyclists would cross over here and then would merge with traffic and go northbound in a shared lane situation like they like they do today. Uh, and then whenever the Fenton Street cycle track is extended through Fenton Village, this would go away and become a regular crosswalk again. The crossover would, would be converted to a regular crosswalk for pedestrians. In terms of our schedule, um, final design and permitting is gonna happen in 2021. Uh, we're working with our partners at the Montgomery County Parks Department and the Maryland State Highway Administration on those uh, plans and permitting uh, permits. And uh, construction would occur in, could occur as early as 2022, although the depends a little bit on how long it takes to get permits and what the financial, financial situation is at the time. Um, and with that, I'm gonna go into the Fenton Street Bikeway study. If anyone has any questions they would like clarified, and we're not gonna take questions right now, but if you send those uh, via the chat feature to Corey Pitts, uh, we'll get those, we can address those uh, in, in clarifying questions. Uh, in terms of the Fenton Street Bikeway study, um, the scope of this study was looking at the different impacts and issues that affect the Fenton Street corridor and the, the feasibility of installing a separated bike lane in the corridor. The study did in, does include seven alternatives that were generated uh, based on trying to measure and mitigate impacts in the corridor. And each of these alternatives is analyzed based on those impacts and includes things like traffic, parking, loading, sidewalks, transit cost, and other things as well. Um, just for some background, the, this study was originally started back in 2017. Um, but the study was not completed back then, the initial study, uh, there were two reasons that it was put on hold. The first is that lot three, which was right here, uh, had closed, but garage three, which is underground here, had not yet opened to replace it. Um, and there was some concern that we weren't getting good parking data with lot three being closed and garage three not being open. So we decided to put it on hold until garage three was open. The other reason the study was put on hold was because uh, our initial run of scenarios assumed we would not widen Fenton Street, that Fenton Street would stay the same width as it is today. Um, and what we found was we were about two feet short of being able to retain a lot of parking uh, compared to keeping the curves where they are now. So we wanted to expand the, um, the range of the study to look at what would happen if we could widen it, what would the impacts be, what would the costs be. And so we decided to reboot the study with an expanded scope um, once garage three opened. So that happened in 2019. The study was restarted at the very end of 2019. We had a community meeting to introduce you all to this concept uh, in January of 2020. Back, it seems like a long time ago, but back when we could meet in person. Um, and one day we will again be able to meet in person, I promise. I just don't know when. Um, so why are we looking at Fenton Street? Uh, Fenton Street is designated in the Bicycle Master Plan of 2018 as a separated bikeway. Um, 
this project will create a continuous trail corridor linking um, all the way down to Union Station in Washington, D.C. via the Metropolitan Branch Trail. So this will essentially operate as a branch of the Metropolitan Branch Trail. And the county's budget does include a CIP project for Fenton Street um, with planning design and some construction funding available. The bikeway study is available on the project website. So I would strongly encourage you to uh, go to the website and download that study. Um, the, the link here will not work if you click on it right now, but if you go to the, uh, if you go to the webpage, uh, you should uh, be able to click on that. Um, the, uh, so I'm just gonna give a brief overview of some of these, um, uh, some of the results of the study. I'm not going to um, go into all the detail because we don't have time for that. And um, so we're going to move on here. The study has a purpose and need that has three points in it. The first point um, is the goal is to improve bicyclist and pedestrian comfort and safety in the Fenton Street corridor. Uh, the second piece is to improve bicycle connectivity both within and beyond downtown Silver Spring. And the third uh, purpose and need is to provide balanced multimodal transportation options for all users, that's pedestrians, cyclists, transit users, and yes, drivers and delivery vehicles as well. So we're trying to balance the needs in the corridor. In terms of existing conditions, um, Fenton Street is pretty consistent in its width, except in two different sections. So north of Rotor Road, and, and Rotor Road is the street that is halfway between Ellsworth Drive and Colesville Road. It intersects Fenton Street, essentially uh, at the Ellsworth Place shopping mall. Um, so south of Rotor Road, including the Fenton Village portion, uh, Fenton Street is 44 feet wide, curb to curb. And north of Rotor Road, it's 48 feet curb to curb, so it's four feet wider. Uh, the master plan right-of-way is 80 feet, but the actual right-of-way uh, varies from 64 feet to 80 feet. So there are some places where the right-of-way is narrower than in other places. In terms of intersections, there are eight signalized intersections in the study area. I just want to point out for clarification that the Maryland 410 Fenton Street um, intersection is not one of those eight because it's out of the study. It's out of the study area, so it's, it would be the ninth intersection if you were counting that one. I also want to point out that we have two hawk signals that are currently in the design process that the Division of Traffic Engineering and Operations is working on that are going to be coming soon to Fenton Street. Uh, those will be located at Fenton Street and Rotor Road and Fenton Street and Pershing Drive. That's the road that's next to Whole Foods. And now a hawk signal is what's pictured in the bottom picture there. Uh, it's a signal that is activated by pedestrians. So you push a button. Uh, ordinarily, the, the signal is dark and it then goes, once the button is pushed, it goes to a flashing yellow light uh, that then transitions into a steady yellow light, which then transitions into two steady red lights, uh, at which point the walk sign comes on and pedestrians can begin crossing. Uh, during the time when the upraised hand is flashing to indicate that pedestrians should finish their crossing, uh, the two red signals become alternating flashing red, as you can kind of see what's ha that's what's happening in the picture. Um, and um, the, uh, um, at that point, drivers can, can proceed through the crosswalk after they stop. And then once the uh, hand is, is steady uh, and, and pedestrians have cleared, the signal goes dark again. Um, I just want to, um, I am getting people who are sending chats to me. I, I'm trying to give the presentation, so I can't monitor the chat. So please don't chat at me. If you, if you have questions or comments, please chat at Corey Pitts. But the question is, uh, is isn't there already a signal at Pershing? Uh, there is not a signal at Fenton and Pershing. Um, it is, it's just a crosswalk. Uh, the nearest signals are at Ellsworth and Lane Avenue. In terms of traffic volume, um, the, we did collect traffic volume data, including bicyclists and pedestrians back in 2017. We collected more data in 2020. This was mainly to sort of confirm what had uh, happened with the, uh, the uh, traffic over time. And we found that the 2020 counts showed that traffic had really not changed very much on Fenton Street. So the 2017 counts uh, were still accurate. The average daily traffic on Fenton Street is around 10,500 vehicles per day. And bicycle volumes uh, are about four to five per hour right now on Fenton Street. But I do want to point out that Fenton Street is not a very comfortable place for cyclists to ride currently. And we expect that those numbers would increase significantly if there were protected bike infrastructure in the corridor. Um, 
We also looked at crash data over a three-year period, including all of 2017, 2018, and 2019. Uh, almost all the crashes, 87% involved vehicles only. 10% uh, of the crashes did involve pedestrians and 3% of the crashes involved cyclists. In terms of severity, uh, three quarters of the crashes involved property damage only, a quarter involved injury, and luckily in that three-year period, there were no deaths related to traffic crashes. In terms of parking, this is something that I know is a very uh, big concern for the neighborhood. Um, there are currently 91 parking spaces on street, on Fenton Street, from Fifth Avenue up to Cameron Street. On the east-west streets within one block of, um, uh, on the east-west streets within one block of uh, uh, Fenton Street, there are 207 on-street parking spaces. Um, the public lots and garages that are within one block of Fenton Street have 4,000 741 uh, parking spaces, and those are shown in the, the blue circles. Uh, the pink and purple circles here show privately owned parking areas. So those are parking that's available for people who uh, are going to those businesses, but they're not available to people who are parking generally um, and, uh, and moving on. Um, so in terms of on-street um, uh, parking utilization, and this is, the numbers refer to particular blocks. Um, the, uh, the utilization ranges from 59% up to 95%, uh, depending on which block you're on. The uh, garage and lot utilization, as I was saying, uh, ranges from 33% to 88%. In Fenton Village, that's the area south of Wayne Avenue, uh, the average on-street utilization on Fenton and the side streets uh, ranges from 73% to 79%. Uh, in the Ellsworth District, the average on-street utilization ranges, and that's the area between Wayne and Colesville, uh, ranges between 66% and 83%. And in North Silver Spring, that's the area between uh, Colesville Road and Cameron Street, the average utilization ranges between 83% and 91%. And that range refers to uh, the, the average utilization on any given block. At any, so at any given time, for example, that eight, between 83 and 91% of the spaces are occupied. That's what that uh, um we also know that loading is a critical need in the corridor. Um, we have um, lots of businesses who need to get deliveries um, for, for products that they're gonna be selling, but we also have things like parcel services, UPS and FedEx who are delivering um, uh, products to, to residents and businesses in the corridor. We have food pickup services, paratransit, ride hailing apps, lots of different loading needs in the corridor. Uh, over the past several months, we have gone out into the corridor on several occasions and um, spoken to 37 businesses. We've tried to speak to others and we're still continuing our, out our outreach effort, but we have not always been able to get in touch with owners or managers. Um, but we have learned a lot about the delivery needs in the corridor and they can range from everything up to a truck and trailer combination like what you see in the top picture, uh, to box trucks like the one you see in the bottom picture and even um, cars and vans can be used for delivery. What we've learned is that loading tends to be more typical in the morning, um, but it really can happen at any time. Um, and we're going to continue to work with business owners over the coming uh, months as we go through the design process to uh, understand what their specific needs are. Um, and there's just some examples of businesses that we talked to in the corridor to understand their needs. Uh, there's a locksmith on Fenton Street who only has access through the front of his building, uh, and he has locksmiths who come and go during the, uh, uh, throughout the day to, they need to come and pick up their materials and uh, tools. So they need to be able to stop relatively close by um, for a few minutes. Uh, that's one example. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on. Um, but what, what I'll say is that I know that uh, um, a one size fits all approach does not work for, um, for all the businesses, um, we are going to uh, really try and uh, work on, work with those businesses as we go forward um, and uh, as we uh, work on the specifics that, that uh, we are, uh, we know that there are a lot of specific needs out there. We're gonna continue to work with businesses to, uh, to, to um, figure out what those needs are and how to address those. And I wanna point out that in the, um, in the, uh, uh, the concept plans that you'll see out there, those are, um, there are some loading zones that are shown. It doesn't mean that those are necessarily going to be in exact, those exact locations. We're going to work with 
through the design process to figure out exactly what uh, what uh, needs to, to happen. There is a lot of transit service on the corridor. Uh, Fenton Street uh, does carry four ride-on bus routes and one metro bus route. Um, there are a lot of other bus lines that cross over Fenton Street. Um, the Purple Line station under construction at Fenton Street and Wayne Avenue is planned to open between 2023 and 2024. We don't have a firm date right now. So one of the critical efforts that we're going to be working on as part of this uh, project is to uh, deal with bus stops that conflict with the cycle track. Um, we may have floating bus stops like you've seen in other areas. Um, exactly how those work and where those locations are going to be are still we're, we're going to work with up the design process. And I want to point out that we've not made any decisions right now um, uh, regarding uh, whether we're going to eliminate, consolidate, or relocate bus stops. Um, so those will uh, things we working working out through the design process. But we are operating under the assumption right now that uh, there will be no um, elimination of bus stops. Um, with that, I'm going to get into the alternatives. Um, the alternatives were developed with the project purposes in mind, and, and you, you saw this earlier um, in the uh, in the presentation. Improving bicyclist and pedestrian safety and comfort, improving bicycle connectivity, um, and providing balanced multimodal transportation options throughout the corridor. And in terms of developing the um, the alternatives, we had different goals and considerations that we are trying to balance to, um, uh, to uh, really get the, uh, the, the alternatives developed. So what that means is like twisting dials on these things. These are the different dials that we can twist to change the alternatives. So uh, creating a safe and continuous bikeway is one of those, uh, those things and that's in all the alternatives. We always wanna minimize impact to parking, but the different alternatives do impact it differently based on, um, on how, how much other things are balancing the corridor. We, of course, want to minimize the economic impact uh, to businesses, both in the short term during construction and also in the long term after construction is completed. We're trying to maximize vehicular and pedestrian movement, meaning we want to make sure we have adequate sidewalks and that we're not impeding traffic um, too much. Uh, to the maximum extent practical, we want to improve accessibility, so making sure that all of our sidewalks meet and exceed um, accessibility guidelines for people who have disabilities. We want to minimize the impact of the street trees in the corridor. We need to accommodate transit, loading, and property access. And we want to in implement stormwater management best practices wherever it's possible. We're also trying to minimize the impacts to utilities and the need to acquire right of way. And as necessary, um, we want to minimize costs. Um, so if you'll hold on uh, one second here. Um, Okay, um, so the alternative, um, there are seven alternatives. They're, they're labeled um, A through G in the report. Um, the alternatives were developed basic, basically from a, a combination of mid-block sections and intersections scenarios. Uh, the mid-block sections determine things like impacts to parking and street trees. The intersection scenarios determine how signals will work, whether uh, there are turn lanes, etc. cetera. Um, Combining a specific set of mid-block treatments and intersection scenarios creates an alternative. Um, we're going to go into some more detail on that, but before I get into those, I want to talk about the common features. Um, there are some common features that are present in all, all seven of the alternatives. Uh, there's always at least one travel lane for vehicles in each direction on Fenton Street, so we are not proposing to make Fenton Street one way. Um, there's always on-street parking um, on the street, um, although the, the total amount varies. Um, there are always uh, on-street loading areas, and they're shown on the plans, but as I said, the exact locations are still, and, and the size and duration, those are things that are still going to be worked out through the design process. We always have sidewalks that are at least five feet wide, and they're always accessible. Um, the bikeway is always on the west side, and it's a two-way bikeway. There's a raised barrier, like the top picture. There's a raised barrier uh, between the bikeway and the travel lane or the parking lane, depending on what's next to the bike lane. Um, there are floating bus stops, uh, although the exact location and design are things that we work out through the design process. And there are corner island treatments at as many of the intersections as possible. And you can see corner islands like the ones at Second and Spring in the bottom picture. Ours will, on Fenton Street will not look exactly the same as these, but they, that's the same concept. 
Um, there are some key differences between the alternatives, and we can really break this down into whether or not there is widening. Two of the alternatives have widening. Um, three of the alternatives essentially move the east curb two feet to the east. Uh, that's the curb on the side, same side of the street as the Whole Foods. Um, they move that curb two feet throughout the entire length of the corridor. And two of the alternatives try and they do widen the street in some places, but they try and limit that widening as much as possible to reduce costs. Um, so each of the alternatives is, is based on sort of prioritizing, as I mentioned before, the, um, um, the uh, those dials, turning those dials. So the uh, alternatives A and D, for example, prioritize saving parking um, for every uh, over everything else. And so that generally means that we don't have turn lanes. Alternative C and E prioritize turn lanes, so we're trying to move traffic. Um, but that is generally at the expense of parking. So all the alternatives have a mixture of impacts. Um, the alternatives are just conceptual. I want to point that out that um, the uh, they are very conceptual and they show a basic layout. The, a lot of things could change as part of um, the information learned during the design process, such as learning where there are utilities, things like that, and also based on the comments that we received from the community. Uh, there are a lot of things that uh, will work out during the design process, including the location, duration, and dimension of the loading zones, bus stop location and design, incorporation of accessible parking, stormwater management, um, traffic signals and turn restrictions. These are all things that we don't have the answers to yet, but we will work those out through the design process. Um, now, I just wanna go kind of through a, um, a quick overview of uh, the alternatives here. So, um, one second. Okay, so um, the uh, in terms of the alternatives, all of the alternatives look at uh, this intersection, which is the intersection of Fenton Street and Silver Spring Avenue. Um, so Fenton Street runs north to south, north is to the right here. Um, Silver Spring Avenue runs east to west, which is top to down in this uh, image. And uh, for your orientation, Cafe La Sac is here. Italian Kitchen is here. Georgia Avenue would be parallel, running left to right off the screen to the top. Grove Street running left to right off the screen to the bottom. Um, Montgomery College is to the left, downtown Silver Spring is to the right. So that's just uh, to help um, uh, understand and orient you to this. So if we look at alternative A, this one does include widening uh, in the um, in the uh, Fenton Village area. Um, the it, the priority here is on street parking. Uh, the on-street parking is on both sides of the street here, but that means we don't have turn lanes. And in fact, the only turn lane in alternative A is northbound Fenton Street at Colesville Road. And left turns across the bikeway would not be protected. That means someone who wants to turn left um, would have just a circular green signal and they can turn left when the traffic is clear, but bicyclists may also be present. So, so this would not allow us to protect the turns between left turns from, and cyclists. Alternative B also includes uh, widening in Fenton Village. But the priority here is basically moving traffic and also left turn protection for cyclists. So in this case, we do have left turn lanes in both directions at the intersections, um, but this means less parking. The parking has to stop further away from the intersection, so this does impact parking, um, although it does better for traffic. Alternative C um, also includes widening in Fenton Village. It prioritizes left turn protection for northbound traffic, but it does not include southbound turns, uh, left turns for, for southbound. There are still left turns permitted, but it would not have a left turn lane for southbound traffic. So this allows us to have a little bit more parking on, on this end of each of these blocks, but it would impact traffic more negatively. Um, alternative D does not include widening. So this is the first alternative we looked at that does not include widening generally, although there, there is some widening uh, around some of the intersections and the bump outs would also be removed as part of this. Um, this, this alternative D prioritizes on-street parking like alternative A does, but uh, because the street's narrower, there would only be parking on the east side. There would be no west side parking. So that's a big, that's a big um, change compared to alternative A. And like alternative A, we would not be able to protect left turns across the cycle track. Um, hey, Matt. Yes. Uh, I just got a request. It seems that I guess when you turn your head or move away from the mic, that's when people are having a little difficulty hearing you. Okay. All right. Let me see if I can. The problem is I have to look at the presentation. Let me see if I can move my computer a little bit, my screen with the camera a little bit closer. All right, so um, alternative E um, also does not include widening in Fenton Village. So D and E are the ones that do not have widening. 
Um, but this one, in this case, we're trying to have the left turn lane. So the northbound would have left turn lane. There would still be no left turn lane southbound, which means we have a little bit less parking on this block potentially. But um, on you know this end of the block, we would have be able to have some more parking. Uh, sorry, I said that backwards. Less less park less parking on this block, more parking on this block. Um, so the lack of southbound left turn lane saves some parking, but it could create additional delay. And like alternative D, because the street's narrower, uh, there would be no parking on the uh, west side of Fenton Street. That's the side of the street that the Cafe Lissac is on. Um, alternative F and G, the one we're going to look at after this, um, those are a little bit um, similar to C, but they're sort of hybrid options. So in this case, we're trying to move traffic as much as possible. We're also trying to preserve parking, especially where it matters the most. And, uh, and that means that, for example, in alternative F, the block between Silver Spring Avenue and Thayer Avenue has a lot of small businesses. So the idea is to um, not have a left turn lane northbound at Thayer, and in fact, to ban left turns at Thayer. And that way we can have parking sort of continuously on this block on both sides of the street. So this saves parking on the block between Silver Spring and Thayer, generally has left turn lanes other places, um, and minimizes widening in, in locations to, to minimize cost. Um, alternative G is essentially the same as alternative F, except that that left turn lane, instead of being no left turn lane at Thayer and let, banning left turns at Thayer, we would have no left turn lane at Silver Spring Avenue and ban left turns at Silver Spring Avenue. So that would save more parking on the block between Sligo Avenue and Silver Spring Avenue, where we also have some small businesses. So think, so these are good examples of how we're trying to balance needs between the different needs, parking, traffic, um, bicycle safety. So I just want to kind of go through a summarization of how the alternatives differ. Um, the safety impacts of these, um, what I mean by safety impacts, we're really talking about whether or not we are able to protect bicyclists from left turns um, with, with signal phasing. Um, alternatives A and D do not allow that. Doesn't mean they're unsafe for cyclists, but we would consider them less safe for cyclists. The other alternatives B, C, E, F, and G do allow us to have left turn protection, so they will be considered safer for cyclists. In terms of traffic impacts, right now on average during the peak hour, it takes about four minutes and six seconds for someone to drive from Gist Avenue to Cameron Street, the whole length of the corridor, about four minutes and six seconds. Um, under the alternatives, we have um, calculated the estimated uh, new travel time. So under alternative A, that's A and, A and D are the worst, the most impacted traffic. Uh, that travel time would go up to seven minutes and 30 seconds, which is an addition of three minutes and 24 seconds. So that's almost doubling that travel time. So B and A, uh, sorry, A and D are, are really bad for traffic. And those are the ones that prioritize parking and don't have turn lanes. Um, the best one for traffic is G, the one you looked at the most recently, uh, which adds about 36 seconds on average to the tra total travel time uh, through the corridor. Um, the others are generally in, in a pretty narrow range here, uh, 42 to 54 seconds. Uh, not a whole lot worse than G, but a little bit worse than G. In terms of parking impacts right now, as I mentioned before, there are 91 on-street parking spaces. Um, alternative A performs the best because we could potentially even add um, three additional parking spaces. Um, alternative um, uh, B and E are the worst for parking impact. Um, remember, D and E are the ones that do not have widening um, because uh, of the need for the additional turn lanes. So those lose 48 parking spaces, uh, which is over half the parking spaces on Fenton Street. But keep in mind that in the whole quarter, there are also parking spaces on the side streets. Um, in terms of estimated costs, now I just want to point out to, that we should read these numbers with a, with a big caveat, and that is at this point, we, there's a lot of unknowns in the design process. So we don't know where all the utilities are. We don't necessarily know what all the needs are. And so we want to be conservative, meaning we want to overestimate the costs right now because we know that we're going to find things that, we, that, are, that will cost money to, to resolve or to, to work around. So at this point, we have a 40% contingency. So we take the estimate and we add 40% to it. That's the contingency. As we get further in the design, that gets smaller because we're more certain about what the costs are. Now, it doesn't mean that the whole project cost may get narrow. If we, if we discover things that are more expensive, that base may go up, but the contingency will go, get smaller. But we've purposefully overestimated on things uh, a little bit to make sure that we are um, calculating enough. And once we get into the actual design process, so sometime next year, we'll have a much better handle on what the costs actually are. So we, we know these numbers are high. We think that they probably are higher than they will be once we go through the design process. But um, you can look in the report to get a better understanding of where those numbers are coming from. Um, so again, it's, 
it's a very conceptual um, cost estimate. Once we get into the design, we'll have a better sense. But in terms of the costs, the cheapest are D and E, which don't have any widening. That makes sense. The most expensive, um, B and C, and A is just slightly less expensive. Um, those are the ones where we're widening to the, basically through the entire corridor. F and G have more limited widenings, so those are places where um, that's sort of in the middle. And just as an example of how working through the design process, we can reduce costs. One of the things that's driving the cost, and one of the reasons that you don't see a big difference in the grand scheme of things between these alternatives is because things like we're putting in protected corner islands at all the intersections, and that requires us to widen out a little bit more, which means we have to rebuild signals, things like that. So we may find that as we get through the design process, we can still do corner islands, but maybe we make them a little bit smaller, maybe we rearrange them a little bit so that we can find ways to save costs. So these are things that we'll work through uh, in the design process. And this is just summarizing the last couple slides that you saw. Um, the, uh, so if it's, if it's red, it's a, a less good or a worse outcome. Green is it's a better, better outcome. Black is sort of in the middle. Um, so the consultants have recommended in the report alternative G. Um, this one scores best when we're balancing the impacts and advantages. Um, alternative G is the least impactful for traffic congestion. Uh, it's in the middle of the pack uh, for saving parking. It maximizes safety in terms of having left turn protection for both cyclists and pedestrians. Uh, it's in the middle of the pack on cost and it's in the middle of the pack on street tree impacts. So that's what the consultants have recommended, but MCDOT's recommendation would be based on the public comment we get tonight and during the public comment period, and also based on feedback that we get from the planning board and the council's transportation and environment committee. Um, in terms of next steps, so as I mentioned, based on the feedback that we get from you uh, and in consultation with the planning board and the t &E committee, MCDOT will recommend a preferred alternative to advance into the design phase. Um, design is expected to start in late winter of 2021, so maybe the March timeframe, uh, and will take at probably take about 18 to 24 months. And this includes permitting. So we do have, we have to get our own permits as well um, because we, we cross, for example, we cross four state highways. Um, if, we, if we include the, uh, the intersection project as one as well. So, we, so this project crosses three state highways. Um, and so we have to get permits from the state. We have to get permits from the Department of Permitting Services. We may have to get permits from the, um, from the Parks Department. So there's a lot of things that happen in the design process. And I want you to be assured that this is not the last time you'll have a chance to weigh in on this meeting. Um, the, uh, we are gonna have additional public meetings at the 30% and 65% design stages. We may have additional meetings beyond that as well. So there are plenty of opportunities for you to weigh in once we get into the design process and get more details going. In terms of phasing, um, the, uh, there's a couple things I wanna point out here. It's a long and complex corridor. Uh, we probably are not gonna be able to build this in one fell swoop. It's probably gonna get broken into phases, but we don't really know exactly where those phases are gonna be. The, the graphic to the right shows the idea of building the section north of Wayne and building the section south of Wayne as separate phases, but it may mean it may be that we need three phases, or maybe it is that we can build it in one phase. We really don't know at this point. There are some related projects though that I wanna point out. The uh, uh, This green section up here that says by others, this is a uh, separated bike lane that's being built through the old planning department headquarters site that's being redeveloped and the developer will build that as part of their project. We also have the Cameron to Planning Place bikeway here uh, that was has already gone through the design process and the public input process and is currently in procurement. So those will open in 2021 and 2022. Down here at the south end of the corridor, as I mentioned earlier, we think we could probably build this section starting in 2022 and that would leave the remainder here to get built in future years, although we don't yet know when that would be. So we're about to go into the public comment period. Um, I would just ask that you please be respectful of the other attendees and making sure that other people have a chance to speak um, by keeping your comments concise. Um, you are gonna need to request to unmute yourself by raising your hand and we're gonna remind you how to do that in just a minute. Uh, and if you dialed in by telephone, you raise your hand by dialing star nine. If you, uh, when once we call on you, call on your name or your phone number, you will need to dial star six in order to unmute yourself. Um, if you don't feel comfortable asking a question or making a comment out loud, you can use the chat feature to chat to Corey Pitts. Um, any questions that you have regarding the, uh, the bikeway or the questions or comments that you have, you, they're all welcome. If it's relevant to this project, it's welcome at this, at this meeting, but we, there are some specific things that we think would be helpful for you to focus on. And those things include things like specific elements in the alternatives that you like or don't like. Um, are there particular blocks or intersections where you have concerns? Um, are there alternatives that you do or don't like? 
Um, and if you have any other concerns that it's relevant, and if there's anything else you think we need to know about this project, uh, that's fair game. So just as a reminder, the way you raise your hand is you click participants, and then you click the raise hand button that will raise your hand. Uh, we will call on you in the order in which you raise your hand. Um, if you have a question you'd rather ask um, by, by text, you can click the chat feature and send that to Corey Pitts. Uh, and he will uh, read those questions out. So this is um, the, my, again, my kind of information. This is gonna stay up. We are accepting comments in writing through um, December 4th, Friday, December 4th. And I would encourage you, even if you make a comment verbally, that you also make a written comment, just that we have a record of it um, that we can uh, put in our spreadsheet and we can make sure that we understand everything that, uh, that you're concerned about. Um, the website is also linked at the top of the page. Um, this, the PDF on our webpage would actually allow you to click on that link. So you'll be able to, uh, well, of course, if you've found the website, if you found the PDF on the website, you're already on the website, but um, uh, this is the website if you haven't been to it. So let me, um, let me go to the uh, participants window here and see if we have anyone with their hand up. And I, I do apologize, it does seem like we have some. Matt, yes. A couple things, I've got some questions that have, have built up, but didn't seem necessarily worth uh, cutting in and interrupting the presentation. I also had a request, could you flip back, I think momentarily to alternative G? Um, yeah. I think after you showed that as the consultant's preferred option, I think people felt like it had been a while since they had seen that one. So okay, just to refresh people's memories. That's an excellent point. So this is alternative G and in general, alternative G does have left turn lanes. We're just looking at the block here where there is no left turn lane on this block. That's to save parking on the block between Sligo Avenue and Silver Spring Avenue. And in this alternative, it would uh, we would be banning left turns from Fenton Street onto Silver Spring Avenue, but you could still turn left and you would still have a left turn lane at Fenton and Sligo and Fenton and Thayer in this alternative. Uh, now, I also wanna point out that for the alternatives, just because we have a map of it does not mean that those are the only options. If you think there are particular, uh, if you think like there's something you're really concerned about and make a comment, maybe it's a lot of comment that we get a lot of, we could mix and match to some degree or we could move things around based on. So it doesn't mean that we're gonna have to pick exactly one of these alternatives. It, it will probably be based on one of these alternatives, but things could change based on the public comment process. Um, so this is alternative D, and you can view all of these alternatives on our website, on the web page. I'm gonna go back to that slide so that you can see the web address here and the public comment deadline. Okay, so I'm going to call on um, uh, Riley, Casey. You should be able to unmute yourself now. Okay, and I, I have unmuted myself on my end. Do you have my yes. audio? Yes. Okay, can... I'd like to, uh, preface my comments by saying I've been a di daily bike commuter through downtown Silver Spring for about 20 years. And uh, I also own a small business in Silver Spring, although not downtown. But I have a couple of questions and, and observations. Uh, uh, at the top of your presentation, I think you had uh, described the, the total number of parking spaces as being somewhere around 4,500. Is that a, a correct uh, op uh, assessment of what you said? Something along those lines. I don't recall exactly what the number from the slide was, but yes. So, so a, a loss of 48 spaces would represent about 1% or a hair more than 1% of the available parking spaces along Fenton Street. Is that is that a correct uh, assessment? Well, in terms of the total number of parking spaces within one block, but I, there is a difference between uh, on-street and off-street parking. Oh, I understand that. Um, but I think... A, uh, we're talking about parking within, say, 100 yards of any given business door door front. Yes. Okay. Uh, and uh, you had also mentioned that uh, uh, there you were taking into account the uh, the travel time from, I guess, uh, uh, 410 East West Highway down to Cameron Street, as uh, and. Uh, playing off uh, the difference, you know, of X number of minutes or seconds additional transit. And I'm curious as to why that's a significant number when you have a six lane high speed road 100 yards away on Georgia Avenue. And Fenton Street, as my understanding is that you're trying to cater to a bunch of and support a number of small businesses who are not really looking for people who are driving through, they're looking for people who are coming to stop. 
So what's what's the significance of the of the travel time down the road? Well, I mean, I, I understand the point that you're making, but it is it is an important factor to look at for the people who are traveling to businesses on Fenton Street or who live on Fenton Street. And also it's a concern for people who live in the neighborhoods near Fenton Street because the concern is that if Fenton Street traffic gets significantly worse, that they will bear the brunt of additional traffic cutting through their neighborhood to avoid those congest that congestion. As, and, as I opposed of, to... and I just want to recognize there are a lot of people in that community who I have been working with over the past year with the Grove Street Project. And I just want to make sure that everyone realizes that that we are trying to make a holistic solution here and we're not trying to foist problems from one area onto other areas. And so we're, we're cognizant of that. Well, uh, 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 an overarching concern of mine is that literally traffic's a bad thing. More cars are a bad thing, making it more likely that you have cyclists, more likely that you have slower moving cars is, a, is an overarching good to the neighborhood, a good to the small businesses and uh, a, a good to the people the, the, in, in the remaining cars. Does, does your office and the people that are making these decisions, do they keep that in mind? Uh, we, we, we appreciate the comment. Do you have, did you have any other comments? I wanna move that's, on. That's, that, that's, that's, all I, that's, that's my bike-centric view of things, yes. Okay, well, thank you for the comment. And um, if you don't mind muting yourself, um, again, so we don't get any background noise. And I'm gonna go ahead and, and move on to the next um, person with their hand up, and that is uh, Betsy Mendelson. I'm I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Uh, let me try again. Am I unmuted? Yes, we can hear you, Betsy. Hi. So um, I want to appreciate all your work in approaching all the small businesses on Fenton. As someone who lives on the bikeway currently uh, built along Cedar Street, I live between Pershing and Ellsworth on the east side of Cedar. Um, those small businesses are part of the vitality of the neighborhood. So I loved hearing you talk about the loading issues, the diversity, the locksmith in particular, I appreciated. And I'm glad that that is a further source of research for you or focus of research. Um, so I agree with the previous speaker's comment that Fenton Street is much more about accessing businesses than about driving through. As someone who's lived in the area for five years, I drive on Fenton when there isn't a lot of business going on because that's the really only the time it is a through street. Um, I think that's the right priority, especially with all the development coming to downtown Silver Spring. I don't believe we should look at bicycle access in isolation from the big boxes that are being built. Um, for me, the diversity of this community and being able to have small businesses is huge so that, um, you know, the character of the street is important. It's an important maybe first start for some businesses. Um, I realize one can't stop change, <laughs> but that said, I'm really glad you're prioritizing the small businesses. I therefore think that the, the left turn signal, I know that that's a risk for bicyclists. I am a bicyclist. I have almost been killed by left turners. Um, given the slow speed of traffic, as the previous speaker said, for cars and frankly for bikes, uh, the left turn signal doesn't really concern me. Um, bicyclists look for the left turners. Uh, hopefully if the street traffic goes at, you know, an average of eight to 12 miles an hour uh, or less, uh, we can all handle that. Um, so I like the less expensive options that don't call for widening, preserve some parking for cars. Um, I also think it's an illusion that pedestrians and delivery people and standing cars will honor uh, the cycle lanes. Again, I say this, um, you know, it's just a common observation. Everyone sees it, that the cycle lanes are not honored very well. But of course I live on the cycle lane. So I've seen it from um, when the parking was removed, when the cycle lane was built um, and how the cyclists were very skeptical of adopting the cycle lane on Cedar Street and Spring Street. And then now it's, it's very common for cyclists to come by. Um, and it's a wonderful thing to use, frankly, as someone who can hop right on it. Um, and given that it's an illusion, I think, um, I hope that the project prioritizes pedestrian access to the businesses. I realize that's not the focus, but it's really uh, pedestrians getting off the buses and not understanding which way the cyclists are supposed to go. And where I live, cyclists going kind of opposite traffic on the other side of the street, it's bizarre. And I really, when I look at the two-way cycle lane on the west side of Fenton Street, I think, well, that's different. 
Um, I want to point out that there's a diversity of marking for bike lanes in this region, a diversity of um, expectations for how bicyclists are, are good travelers and how pedestrians are good walkers. And that diversity is, is complex. So I understand that people who come to these areas and witness and observe and interact with the bike lanes are kind of schooling themselves up on how to, you know, we can, we're not in Amsterdam, right? <laughs> but how we learn as a, as a society to accommodate different travel modes. But I will point out that, um, you know, the striping is weird. Uh, it's like a whole symbolic language you have to learn as a pedestrian, a driver, and a cyclist. Um, my final comment, and, and so I, I think the diversity, the, the new system that you're uh, proposing for Fenton Street is yet another new system to learn uh, for, for the many people who interact in that dense area. My final comment is, um, again, I live on Cedar Street. I, I think one of my big traumas when this beautiful build, bikeway was built was that we had to move our damn gas line and it made a big cut in the bikeway. And I called Matt and I called the gas company and I talked to the contractor and none of those people paid any attention to actually repairing the surface of the bikeway or restriping it with the green and the white the way it should have. So I just wanna point out that when, when we as a society choose to build using exactly the right materials and exactly the right symbolic language and surfaces, it doesn't do us much good if we're gonna be creating that beautiful infrastructure in an area with so many parties who can alter it and not put it back if the materials or the know-how is so specialized. Um, that's kind of a hidden cost. So I would say that the bikeway in front of my house, you know, people actually avoided it for a while because there's, you know, literally nothing a homeowner can do if someone who's bringing utility to your house cuts across the bikeway and just will not repair it the correct way. So that's, those are my four comments. Thanks for listening and to me for so long. And I really value this presentation. Thank you, Betsy. I'm going to lower your hand. Um, actually, I'm, I apologize. I lowered it changed right as I clicked lower hand. So I just lowered someone else's hand. So if you had your hand up and your hand is not up anymore, please raise your hand again and I will I'll get back to you. I apologize for that. The, the list moved right as I was clicking <laughs> lower hand. Um, so our next um, our next person who has their hand up is uh, Zach uh, Weinstein. I'm going to unmute you now, Zach. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Zach. Thank you. Great. Uh, yeah, first I wanted to thank you for a great presentation and just say that I'm really excited uh, for this project. I bike on Fenton Street fairly often um, and I'm really looking forward to having this. I think that it'll be a great change for Silver Spring. Uh, I wanted to oppose the options that widen the street. I think that it adds unnecessary costs to the project. And I also think that when you widen the street, it just encourages people to go faster. Um, and the other comment that I wanted to make was I want to encourage you guys not to prioritize parking. Um, as the first speaker mentioned, uh, and as I think your slide said, I think there are over 4,000 parking spaces and garages and in, uh, on the Fenton Street corridor, and there were hundreds of parking spots on the, on the side streets. Um, when drivers park, it you know, disrupts the flow of traffic and people getting out of their cars can door cyclists. And, you know, just, I feel like whenever you add parking to the mix, uh, it disrupts uh, the buses. And so, you know, you don't, you know, have to get rid of more parking than you need to, but I don't think that that should be a major factor in your decision-making. I really think that the main factors should be uh, bicycle and pedestrian safety. Thank you. All right, thank you, Zach. I'm going to, uh, if you don't mind muting yourself and lowering your hand yourself, that way I don't inadvertently click someone um, again. Uh, Jane Lyons, I'm going to unmute you. You are the next commenter. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Jane. All right, hi, uh, my name is Jane Lyons. Uh, I'm the Maryland and Advocacy Manager for Coalition for Smarter Growth, but I'll be speaking tonight wearing that hat as well as um, the hat of being a resident of downtown Silver Spring. I live on Colesville and East West Highway, so um, this is close to my home. Um, and just last Friday, I biked both Spring Street and Fenton. 
to go pick up lunch and couldn't say that I was too surprised to discover how much of a difference it made to be in a protected bike lane and then not on a protected bike lane once I got to Fenton Street. So I'm very excited about this project and thank you for all of your work on it. Um, I can't wait to see it go forward. So I don't have a singular alternative to advocate for tonight, but uh, we do support the alternatives that protect cyclist safety the most, as well as uh, the alternatives that reduce widening. Um, we believe that on-street parking is important, um, especially deliveries, but should not be the number one priority given the ample garages that are available in downtown Silver Spring. So thank you so much for the presentation tonight and really looking forward to this project. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jane. If you don't mind muting yourself and lowering your hand. Um, our next, uh, the next person in line is Chris Meyer. I'm unmuting you, Chris. Uh, yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, yeah, so um, thanks for taking my question. Um, yeah, I bike these, uh, these roads all the time and uh, I wanna echo, uh, I bike and run these roads all the time. I want to echo some of the previous comments, um, particularly particularly about not widening the road. Um, that doesn't seem to be a good plan. Um, you know, maximizing pedestrian accessibility, I think, is a key, um, as well as keeping in mind Grove and uh, George Avenue. Um, so, as a cyclist, I'll often use uh, George Avenue as the as my way of getting through, just because it's less congested than than Fenton and. Um, and with Grove also to the side, um, that's also, uh, I'll use those roads. So I guess for cyclists, what I'm trying to say too is, um, you know, I see the role of Fenton as getting to the businesses and um, more of like a, a slow walking around area. So I wanna echo the comments about um, th like uh, through speeds not really being a major priority. And I think that would apply both to cars and cyclists. Um, you know, we don't want uh, cyclists running into pedestrians and the like. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, just options that um, primarily uh, uh, protect the safety of walkers, bikers um, would be key. You know, I think maintaining some, some street parking would be good. Uh, but yeah, I do, I do like the plans that retain, um, strive to retain some street parking uh, but then uh, protect the cyclists. And I'll echo that the left turns are awful and um, also the protected bike lanes on Cedar um, are largely ineffective at times due to um, construction and uh, drivers just not honoring those. So, um, so I'm a little bit wary about it. So anything that can be done to really slow down the flow of traffic on, um, on Fenton would be a welcome change. Thank you, Chris. If you don't mind muting yourself and lowering your hand, um, I just want to clarify something that uh, both Chris and Betsy brought up, which was the intrusion of vehicles into the uh, the bikeway. The Cedar Street bike lanes do not have a raised barrier between them and the, the road. They just have the flex posts and paint. The proposal for um, for Fenton Street would be to have a raised barrier. So I'm not saying it's impossible for someone who really is determined to get their car in there. Um, but uh, it will make it uh, more challenging for someone to, to get in the bike lane. Uh, Mel Tall, I'm unmuting you now. I'm trying to unmute you, Mel. Let's try again. Does not seem to want me to unmute you. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Try again. All right. Okay, ahead, no. can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Okay, uh, I suppose in 20 years or so, people will be so accustomed to these bike lanes that they won't be driving over the things and getting in the wrong place. But until then, we have a long learning curve because it's all very new to us. Um, one of the things in the report you were just going through that struck me was that it would be nice to know what the speeds are on Fenton Street. I mean, you, you had the things about the number of minutes or seconds it takes to go from one place to another, but we're always seeing data in terms of speed. And yeah, during this COVID time, it's, I'm not sure how reliable the data would be if you gathered it now, but, but it would be good to know because um, everybody wants to reduce the speed. 
the speed kills and that sort of thing. And, and a lot of this would be about reducing speed. Um, but I'm also, I, I, I hope you'll open, keep the time for comment open way beyond tonight because I hadn't seen this online. I hadn't had a chance to actually look at the diagrams and understand what, what's being proposed here. Uh, it may take a few days to, to understand what the impact is on the actual pedestrian sidewalk and how people are moving around and, and what it's gonna mean on the side streets and the businesses and the parking and the future development. I, how, I, I hope you'll tell me at the end of this, uh, how much longer you'll wait to consider comments that people put in. Um, and, you know, you mentioned the, the, um, the safe, the, the, whatever that business is called that, that sells safes and security and, and such. And yeah, it's, it's tough to walk out of there with a safe in your hands and carry it to your car. So hopefully having parking nearby will be, will be useful. Um, but you do have to consider that about the time you finish this and provide a parking space right in front of him, he'll decide he needs a bigger shop and move. And so I hope you're working with other county departments on economic development and not designing something that's just right for yesterday, but keep in mind the changes that will go on in the, in the future. Um, so that, that's really my, my hope is that you'll get us some speed data and will give us time to read this and think about it before we comment on it. Uh, thank you, Mel. Yeah, to answer your question about the comments, the, the comment period is open uh, until Friday, December the 4th, which is two and a half weeks from tonight. So please take some time to digest the report and the alternatives and give us some comments. There will be additional opportunities to comment as well because um, we will have to give a briefing to the planning board, um, which we are tentatively looking at the end of January for. So uh, once the, uh, when we go to the planning board, you will have the opportunity to give your comments to the planning board. So um, they, they can make recommendations to us. And we will also be giving a briefing to the T&E committee of the council. I don't know whether they will take comment uh, verbally or not, but they usually do take comment in writing. Uh, so there are some people on the planning board who'll be interested in the speeds well, yeah, on and, Sentence and, uh, Street. Yes, yeah, so I, I wanted to give you that part first, but we, Robert Milstead here from Stantec, uh, when we did the counts, we did collect speed data. I didn't report it in the PowerPoint. I'm not sure, I don't recall whether it was in the report or not. It might've been in the appendix, but you know, we, we do have that data. So I, we can produce, pr pr we can give you that data middle, but we, it's you. just not in the presentation. Uh, if you don't mind muting yourself and lowering your hand, um, our next, uh, the next person with their hand up is, uh, Ricky, I'm asking you to unmute yourself, Ricky. All right, I'm, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Ricky. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi, Matt. Thanks for uh, the presentation. And I just wanted to, um, I, I live in uh, North Woodside. I'm a resident here and I bike all over the DEC uh, metro area. Um, one comment I wanted to make sort of echoes uh, something that Betsy said that sort of um, occurred to me is that we have all these different uh, bike lanes throughout the area that have different ways of utilization. You know, some of them are uh, one way, some of them are two way bike lanes on the same side of the street um, at different intersections, depending on whether the intersection is a two way intersection or a one way intersection. Um, there's different expectations of, of utilization for the cyclists as well as pedestrians. And so I think that does tend to be very confusing for all users, drivers included. Um, and so my comment would be just to try to take into account how to regularize um, the usage and the design of your systems so that you're not trying to um, do a different calculation at every intersection that you approach as either a cyclist, a pedestrian, or, um, or a driver. So uh, to me, safety is the most important thing. 
and to make it as easy as possible for all users to not have to recalculate uh, at every intersection will probably increase that safety. So that's my comment and um, thanks a lot. Thank you, Ricky. I'm, uh, I'm gonna call the next person is uh, Paul uh, Dutaccio. I apologize if I have mispronounced that name, Paul. Uh, Distachio. Um, Distachio. Okay, as, go good ahead, as, as good as anything. That, that, that's fine. Let me let me start out uh, up front and 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 display my um, uh, biases here. I've been uh, commuting uh, by bicycle to work for probably close to fifty years at this point. I lived in all over the D.C. metro area and have been commuting from one side to the other for a long time, including through Silver Spring. Um, I would in terms of priorities, say safety, uh, safety number one. Um, one of the prior uh, uh, commenters said, well, cyclists look out for left, left turn, uh, left turners. Um, yes, particularly those of us that have survived uh, this long, but we're seeing a huge uptick in new cyclists uh, and they aren't necessarily quite as experienced as uh, many of the people who are making comments here tonight and I really need, we really need to prioritize safety uh, over, in my opinion, over anything else. Um, as many people have pointed out, Georgia Avenue is a good through street. Traffic speed certainly should not be a high priority. Plenty of parking. Um, obviously, we need to continue to be aware that uh, merchants need good, easy access for their customers. I'm not talking about getting rid of all the, all the parking, but that would certainly not be uh, my number one priority. Really, more importantly than anything is that the county move ahead on this project. We've waited and waited and waited uh, and waited uh, for it to go, and we need to move. It is uh, a critical link. We build a little bit of a bike lane here, and then we have a few blocks of uh, regular street and then we pick up again and then we put a little bit of paint down and we don't build long connecting stretches and this is a critical link as you pointed out in your presentation uh, we're building out the Met Branch Trail DC is making some progress um, you can go mostly through Tacoma Park um, this will be a, a, a critical link in making a continuous uh, a bicycle path uh, all the way out to Bethesda, through Silver Spring, through Tacoma Park, into DC. Uh, and more than anything, we need to uh, get this done. So thank you very much for your attention and time. Thank you, Paul. I'm gonna mute you and lower your hand. And next up we have uh, Dave Helms. Sorry, Dave, I accidentally clicked just as you are muting yourself. Uh, there you go. Okay, right, I'm here. Thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks, Matt. Great job. Uh, appreciate the, the, you know, working with the Grove guys to make sure that congestion doesn't flood over there from squeezed from Fenton. But I mean, haven't you solved that problem uh, by kind of studying that first? And, and that's probably why we're second on, on Fenton. Uh, second question is, in terms of the narrowing, you know, given COVID and the demand for sidewalk uh, real estate for El Fresco eating, has that uh, imperative been considered or that priority in the streetscape uh, so that uh, the businesses that have restaurants and cafes have the space with the pedestrians, with the bicyclists, uh, and maybe that that is you know, businesses have been giving up parking spaces to have, uh, you know, more outdoor, uh, you know, ex experience. So that's another question. Third question is, shouldn't the speed limit be 20 miles an hour and, and no more, given the character, whatever, this is a minor con connector. Uh, you know, if we want to, we're building bike lanes. On the one hand, that might give you a, a faster a rationale for for the average this posted speed limit, but given the nature of this congestion and uh, you know with pedestrians and bicyclists, it seems like 20 miles an hour should be it. 
but I echo everybody else's opinion, Ricky, Zach, Betsy, and Paul, uh, safety ought to be prioritized. Uh, that's all I have, thanks. All right, thank you, Dave. Um, just to answer those questions, um, uh, well, I, I don't know that I can really solve the, the situation on Grove Street. We are working with that community on solutions to create a neighborhood greenway, but they're, you know, we still don't wanna be forcing a lot of traffic into the neighborhood. Um, in terms of sidewalk cafes, we have not looked at converting this parking space or any of the streetscape to additional sidewalk dining. Uh, that is certainly a great comment, and we can look into that when we're talking to businesses going forward. Although by the time this project is being built, COVID-19 should be, let's hope, fingers crossed, should be long gone. Um, and in terms of the speed limit, um, Maryland, the, the Maryland uh, state law does not permit local jurisdictions to set speed limits below 25 miles per hour. So we could put a sign up that says 20 miles an hour, but we couldn't enforce a speeding ticket against someone who was going more than 20 miles an hour. So um, we, we, and we have a policy of not putting up signs that are unenforceable. So unless the state law changes, um, we cannot sign the street at less than 25 miles per hour. Um, the next person with their hand up is Sonia. I'm gonna unmute you, Sonia. Oh, hold on, Looks, let me, let me, let's try again. Go ahead, Sonia. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, we can hear you, go ahead. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I'm very excited about the plan and I um, uh, understand a lot of the comments that are talking about, uh, that have been made about um, the speed. And I actually wanted just to comment in the other direction that I, I very much appreciated how um, there was an assessment of how long uh, it would take to get down the street with each uh, alternative because I actually am a frequent bus rider and uh, that is the first thing I was thinking of uh, how long would it take the buses in addition to other cars which are I think probably less important but it is very important for buses to be able to at least to me buses to be able to get through from Colesville to East West Highway in a reasonable time frame um, else it would be a disincentive to, to want to ride them. And some of the buses that have to go that route go quite far and, and people really need them. So I appreciate that um, evaluation of how long it would take. Uh, thank you, Sonia. I, I myself am uh, largely a, a transit rider. So uh, I, I, I mean, I also bicycle, but I, I take the bus to get around a lot. So I understand that concern. That's a very good concern. We are working with our partners in Ride On and WMATA on bus stops and how buses will get through the corridor. Uh, next up, we have Steve. I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself, Steve. Go ahead. Me. Matt, thank you very much for a great presentation. Um, uh, I am a longtime resident of East Silver Spring. I'm on the board of the East Silver Spring Civic uh, Association and uh, I live just south of the uh, uh, 410 and Fenton Street intersection. So I want to start off by saying I was very pleased to, to see that piece of work. I think uh, those uh, changes are long overdue, getting rid of those, uh, those uh, high speed off ramp lines uh, would be great. Um, in terms of the bikeway study, uh, I have to say I came into this kind of dreading what I was going to see, <laughs> um, but I, I do want to uh, quickly, you know, flip to saying that uh, I think this is a been a, what I've seen is very balanced and thorough. Uh, streets are very complex organisms, if you will, particularly urban streets like this, neighborhood urban streets like this, and I I, I just applaud the the level of thoroughness and. And, and trying to balance so many factors. Um, I heard a couple of things in comments that um, uh, I, I guess I should mention, I'm also a practicing architect and uh, planner. Uh, my firm does a lot of mixed use planning projects. So um, I'm pretty well attuned to a lot of the, the issues here. And I think one of the myths about uh, parked cars uh, that, that somehow, um, there's enough parking here and, and taking away a few spaces shouldn't really hurt. Um, I think the reality of on-street parking is that there's a lot of good to it. And it's not just trying to feed the beast of parking cars. Uh, it really is a great safety feature um, 
because there's a psychology when one is driving down a street, parked cars, they just psychologically tells you to slow down and be a little more careful. It almost doesn't matter what speed limit signs get posted. It's all about the physical design and perception of the street. And if you have things like parked cars and neck downs, and if all those cues, all those devices really add up um, and reinforce safety. Uh, another interesting thing with on-street parking is it really helps to reinforce a pleasant sidewalk experience because it's a nice barrier between you and, 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 and traveling cars. Um, and you, I, I don't know if we have any of the businesses on the phone, but uh, one of the things we talk a lot about when we're designing these sorts of projects in my firm is it's what's known as teaser parking. You have a really hard time uh, convincing businesses that there isn't a value to that parking. So anyway, that's that's uh, a, a lot on the parking, but I think it's just an important part of the organism for a number of reasons, and I just wanted to stress all of that. And uh, uh, thank you again for, for the study, and, and thanks for listening. Uh, thank you, Steve. I uh, appreciate uh, the comments. Uh, Jonathan Bernstein, you're next. Uh, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Yeah, thanks very much, Matt. I have one observation and a couple of qu some quick questions. The first is um, the Spring Street bike lane and the Second Avenue bike lane means that I have a civilized route to bike to Fenwick Beer and Wine. So thanks so much for that. <laughs> um, questions. Old way is ponderous study, new way is pop-ups to see how changes work. So isn't there some way to just use cones to create a bikeway and sidewalk dining on Fenton to see how it works and to see how disruptive it is of traffic, of parking, of safety. Um, also, is there anything about increasing bike parking along Fenton? It's gotten better, but can be improved because that would also help businesses. Uh, also, so are any of the intersections along Fenton gonna be protected intersections or not quite? And I guess my last is more a general point, which is if there's a way we can basically promise drivers that they'll, if they go slower, but they'll, it, the traffic will be more fluid, so they'll get places more regularly, maybe not speedily. Thanks, Matt. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Let me just try to answer a couple of those questions. So the challenge of doing a pop-up bike lane on Fenton Street is the bump outs. Um, we, on Woodmont Avenue in Bethesda, we have done pop-up bike lanes, uh, I believe twice for Bike to Work Day. We did not, we were not able to do it this year because of COVID-19 and Bike to Work Day was canceled. Um, but we're now in the process of building a cycle track on Woodmont Avenue. So that was a great example of where we were able to do it. But because of the bump outs on Fenton Street, it would be very challenging to do that. Um, in terms of bike parking, um, the, the real challenge is that the sidewalk space is pretty limited on, on Fenton Street as it is right now. But as part of this project, one of the things that we will look at is can we accommodate additional bike racks maybe in the buffer between the sidewalk and the bikeway or if there are, or if there's a wide space between the bikeway and the roadway or the parking lane, we are going to look at opportunities to provide additional bike parking in the corridor. Can we answer that with yes. Um, in terms of protected intersections, if you look at the plans, you can kind of see some proto protected intersections in those plans. And the idea is to put corner islands at as many of the intersections as possible. They look a little different than the ones on Second Avenue because we learned from installing the ones on Second Avenue. One of the things that we learned was that um, the the bend outs for the bike lane at that intersections are too sharp, and a lot of cyclists leave the bike lane and go across the aprons. So we're trying to make this more of a straight shot for the bicyclists on Fenton Street so they don't bend out quite as much. There's still a little bit of a lateral shift. So even though they don't have that bend out, those still are the same intersection types. And uh, the point taken with trying to create more reliability in the system, um, that's kind of beyond my expertise, but we're always looking for ways to try and create a more predictable experience for everyone. So thank you for that. Uh, Jay is next. I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself, Jay. Uh, hey, Matt, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you again for this uh, amazing uh, presentation. Um, I concur with a lot of people who just spoke about, you know, the 
the intent and what 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 we're trying to do with uh, bikes and, and enabling pedestrians to have a safer environment. Um, the, the Fenton Street, in my opinion, as we all know, is also a great um, is a great connector to various regional um, efforts, such as the you know the Capital the uh, Crescent Capital Crescent Trail, the Metropolitan, um, the um, the Purple Line. When it creates, when it when it eventually gets done, uh, it will make a connection down to Sligo Park. Um, so you know, having all these different um, uh, efforts bubble up, and 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 sit, so the Fenton Street um, Bikeway, this nexus of all these, uh, really it really makes us um, uh, the, the the nexus for all these things, and so we should therefore be the leader uh, toward a safer and pedestrian friendly and safer bike and pedestrian friendly environment. Um, so that's more of just my my statement. Um, I just I just you know when I hear about parking and cars and, and driving and certain speeds, you know, honestly, we have enough parking in the area. Um, if we want to lead, we have to, we have to sometimes be bold and this is our chance to be bold. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Jay. Um, all right. Next up we have, um, Dan Reed. I'm unmuting you, Dan. Thank you. Um, Hi, uh, my name is Dan Reed. Uh, I grew up in downtown Silver Spring. My partner and I both work in downtown Silver Spring. In fact, my partner works for a local business on Fenton Street, and we own a home in East Silver Spring. Uh, I just want to say uh, thank you for, for being here this evening and putting up with the Zoom bombing earlier. Uh, it's been great to see the county invest in a bike network in Silver Spring and, and making it safe and comfortable to bike here on Fenton Street. But, you know, I'll note that this project just doesn't do that. It will also make it safer and more comfortable to walk on Fenton Street, to wait for the bus, to visit restaurants and enjoy outdoor dining, to participate in the life of downtown Silver Spring, in part because redesigning this street can help car traffic. You know, there are some parts of Fenton Street where drivers do speed and act recklessly, especially outside of rush hour, and it, I'm sure it discourages a lot more people from walking and biking here. I'm glad that each of these alternatives all preserve some form of street parking, you know, especially for the folks who really need it. Uh, people with mobility needs, ride hailing vehicles like Lyft and Uber, curbside pickup, or loading and unloading packages. We have literally thousands of parking spaces nearby for everyone else, and I think it's a worthy trade-off for a safer, calmer street. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, going to lower your hand now. Uh, Alan, Allison Gillespie, I'll unmute you. Go ahead, Allison. You, it looks like you've dialed in by phone. You may need to dial star six to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead, Allison. Uh, oh, great, okay. Um, thanks for a great presentation. And uh, I've been following this project all along and I, I'm excited about it. Um, I, I think much like Dan said, it's good to have places for delivery but everyone else can easily find parking. And I think it's really important in thinking about bikes and adding bike lanes, even if you're taking away a few parking spaces, bikes add more than they take away. By putting bikes into this scenario in a much um, larger way, you're adding a lot of potential customers, a lot of potential diners, um, you're adding a lot of street life that will ultimately, I think, benefit those businesses um, many times over. I avoid Fenton right now as a bicyclist and a driver. It's terrible to be on. And I often even forget it's there because it's so unpleasant. And I look forward to a day when that's not true. I think a bike lane also here is especially appropriate because there's something that never gets talked about in downtown Silver Spring on this side, which is Montgomery College, has become a very strange island on the side of, of Silver Spring. And that always seems unfortunate to me. What, I had a family member who was a full-time student there for a year, and it's so isolated. And part of the reason it's isolated is because of the terrible driving um, scenario all around it. It's belted in by these horrible roads, um, Fenton being one of them. And I could totally foresee the better bike access, particularly if it's gonna make that network that an earlier caller talked about, um, a better network of bike lanes from the mass transit options to Montgomery College is really gonna bring a lot more street life and a lot more customers to those businesses. 
Um, I would like to also prioritize safety, as several other people have said. I understand that someone's trying to be all cool about saying, oh, we can figure out the left turn lanes. But as someone who only a year ago started using my bike as serious transportation, um, it took a lot of guts for me to get on the street. And I don't think it should be that way. I think it should be relatively easy. We want our bike lanes to be successful. We want them to be used by lots and lots and lots of people. If we're gonna to pay for that infrastructure, we don't want there to be any barriers to access we don't want it to be a special club that only the toughest of the tough can use. The bike lane should be very easy to use. It should be very intuitive. So I definitely would prioritize safety over, over all else. And I would be very, very uh, wary of putting the left lane ahead, left turn lane ahead of, of bikes. Um, I also just want to say at the end that even though it was only a small part of your presentation, I think it's going to have a huge impact. The um, 410 intersection um, those slip lanes, those, those, that's horrible. For the whole time, the whole 25 years I've lived in the area, I've literally given people directions to avoid those lanes. I've had guests from out of town told them to go miles out of their way because you get lost there. It's very dangerous. The signage, there's no way to make signage to make that intersection safe. So um, even though it was only a very small part of your presentation, I think that's going to have a very large impact and I'm very excited about it. I think it's gonna be very positive. So thank you very much, Matt. Um, it was a it was a really good presentation and I'm, I'm excited to see it all. Thank you, Allison. Um, next up we have uh, Bethlehem. I'm asking you to unmute now, Bethlehem. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Bethlehem Adana. I am the owner of Lisa Cafe by the intersection of the Penton and uh, Silver Spring Avenue. Thank you, Stephen. I know you've reached out to me uh, maybe a few weeks or maybe I would say six weeks ago to discuss more depth on the project about the bikes, but I couldn't make it. Um, I do appreciate all the feedback and the comments that I heard for most of the attendees, especially I know most of you are not business owners, but I really, really appreciate that you all are concerned about the situation that we have to go through. But my concern is I don't see any business owners in this meeting. Uh, me, I'm, a, I'm also a landlord across the street. Italian Kitchen Blocks is owned by me and my husband. I did not get any information as a landlord. I only got the information as a business owner. So I was just hoping how many business owners you reached in that area. Did you get a chance to talk to them and hear them hear back? Because construction itself on Fenton Streets has been such very challenging for us the past two, three years based on the number of projects that's gone on. And then this is going to be another project that's happening. And do you have any kind of consideration on how we're going to survive through that process? Did you get enough feedbacks and uh, so forth? But you're right. I do appreciate the fact that we do want the extending lanes. Uh, of course, the pedestrian and safety is really important. And um, um, that's all. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Bethlehem. Really glad you were able to join uh, join us tonight. We did. Uh, uh, try and reach out a couple times and so I'm glad we finally were able to connect and, and I hope that we are still able to meet with you in person uh, along with any other business owners we haven't talked to. So um, we did, we have met so far with 37 business owners in the corridor um, and we're going to continue to reach out to people as we go forward. Um, and your points are very well taken. Um, your needs are, are very specific. Um, I mean, every business owner's needs are very specific and we want to try and deal with those needs um, as we go through the design process. So thank you very much for, for being involved and, and I hope that we will see you uh, at future meetings as well. Um, Bill, I'm asking you to unmute yourself, Bill. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, uh, my comments can su be summarized in a couple of statements right now. Five minutes, roughly, for the entire leg of this on Fenton Street. How much time will it take to cut through Grove Street? I would major less than five minutes. And uh, if I want, I want to go into my comments about this, but that sums it up. You're going to dump traffic into the neighborhood. Um, you talk about having a holistic view, but it seems like a false pretense. I don't see similar data being presented on these charts as you present on the Greenway. Um, uh, for instance, um, 
if you look at the speeds, people have talked about the speeds. If you do a rough calculation, I got, got on Google Maps, it's about eight-tenths of a mile going from the um, beginning of this project to the end of this project based on the map. Uh, given the time that it takes four minutes, you're talking at current, uh, um, current speeds time-wise based on the data that you've collected, you're talking 12 to 15 miles an hour. Uh, when you do the modifications and you increase the amount of time it's going to take, you're now driving 10 to 13 miles an hour. Uh, on Grove Street, even with uh, some of the cutoffs uh, that we've experienced uh, for um, the COVID situation, we're clocking speeds of 22 miles an hour and uh, a high speed of 43 miles an hour. Uh, it's important for me to bring this up. I live on Grove Street. My property has been damaged. My vehicles have been damaged based on volume and people cutting through. And just recently, as a pedestrian, as a bicyclist, I've been hit on Grove Street. On Grove Street, uh, the reason I was hit was because somebody was trying to cut through. They were frustrated that they had to be behind a bicycle. And uh, at the last turn, they decided to clip my back tire, uh, for which I called the police. Uh, luckily, I was not injured, but you're going to have road rage uh, because you've got competing issues here. So um, what I don't understand is we've got an increase in bicycle volume. I get that. Uh, so we're prioritizing Fenton Street and Grove Street. Uh, and by necking down Georgia Avenue, taking away that middle lane, you're guaranteed to dump vehicles off into the neighborhood, particularly on the, uh, the Greenway, which is going to compete with the objectives of the Greenway, which is specifically increased pedestrian safety usage and cyclist safety and usage. Um, so I, I, I'm having a hard time seeing how this project or the Greenway are complementing each other uh, and the choices that you're making, I don't see them being um, coordinated. Sorry for the uh, phone ringing. Um, uh, one thing that I wanted to ask you, had you considered a, uh, a circle at the East-West Highway uh, intersection? It used to, be, you mentioned it used to be a circle. Why not go back to a circle? That would that would uh, certainly aid and abet um, people who are trying to get uh, to Fenton Street uh, or really anywhere, get rid of the traffic light like you have at Chevy Chase Circle. Um, has that been considered? Uh, thank you for those comments, Bill. Um, and I appreciate that you have been involved with the growth Street uh, process as well. Um, we are working holistically between Grove and Fenton. This, this study is focused particularly on Fenton Street, um, but it's part of a larger effort by DOT that looks at Grove Street and also the Maryland 410 intersection, which you also mentioned. So there's three, three related projects and this presentation was not focused on Grove because we just had a meeting on Grove back in September. Um, but yes, our goal has always been to a holistic approach to look at ways to mitigate traffic, country traffic on Grove Street. So uh, the second stage of the Grove Street pilot, um, which I hope if anyone is interested in, they will join us for our next community meeting, which will be sometime in the spring. Um, the goal of that project will be to try and find ways to reduce that cut through traffic. So there may not be any perfect solutions and every solution that we look at has trade-offs for the different people who are trying to use uh, these streets. So we understand that. Uh, in terms of the roundabout, we, we did not look at um, a roundabout uh, at this location. Um, I think the, the real challenge is while there used to be a roundabout there, the intersection was significantly different design back then. So um, I'm not sure that that would really be a, a solution that would work very well. And also the idea of sort of continuously moving traffic, even though it is potentially slower with the roundabout, um, we are trying to improve pedestrian and bicycle safety here. So being able to phase protect those movements is, is a critical um, factor. And I will say that while this would be a roundabout and not a major traffic circle, as a cyclist and a pedestrian, some of the circles um, 
that are not signalized are very challenging to cross. Uh, as an example, I'll cite uh, trying to uh, bike down Western Avenue and cross Connecticut Avenue at Chevy Chase Circle. Uh, it's almost impossible to get a break in traffic during peak hours to get over into the circle. So uh, they're not always um, great in areas where you have high pedestrian and, and bicyclist volumes. And it depends on how they design. So that's really kind of beyond the scope of what we're looking at. But thank you for uh, for that comment. Um, next up, we have uh, Ronit Dances. I'm going to unmute you. You should be able to unmute yourself. Go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, you're you're very uh, very quiet. But could you try and speak up a little bit? Hey, how's this? That's better. Thank you. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you. Thank you so much for all of your work. And for all, and, you know, we, uh, we, really, we really can't hear you. Uh, Roni, we really we can't hear you, Roni. Can you, can you try to speak a little bit louder? Hang on. I'm just... Sorry. Okay. How, can yes. you hear me now? Yes, much better. Okay. I, yeah, that's, sorry, I was trying to change that. Um, briefly, I just wanted to thank you and everybody who's worked on this project. Um, this is, these are some really exciting and interesting options for downtown Silver Spring. Um, I, I live in, I live in downtown Silver Spring on Colesville. I've been here for about five years. I walk to Fenton so I can pick up, you know, for, pick up my prescriptions at the Safeway to, to get my dry cleaning. Um, to get, you know, sometimes to get takeout. And one of the things that I think it needs to, worth commenting on here is that we have had a massive biking boom in the wake of the pandemic that isn't changing. And one of the things that I have seen in downtown Silver Spring are more people, not just on bikes, but on scooters, on skateboards, of people of all ages, um, getting around in different ways. And I'm really excited that we have a project here that will allow more walking, more biking, more, you know, more green and sustainable transportation in this area. And this is, this is, this is thrilling. I think it will also be, it has a potential to have to, you know, to help us with our economic recovery because this is the kind of thing that helps people move around, makes a place exciting and makes a place, makes some, you know, makes us the kind of place we all wanna live in. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ronit. Um, so just, uh, we have three people with their hands up still, um, and we have about 11 minutes left in the meeting. So if you have not spoken and you wish to make a comment, please uh, raise your hand now. Um, uh, I'm gonna call on Mel. Uh, Mel, uh, I think has a follow-up. So go ahead, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself, Mel. Right, uh, Ronit got to it just before I did. I was noticing the uh, lack of talking about scooters in here. And uh, DOT is really making a lot of headway on getting scooters out on the sidewalks. So I, I hope you can clarify in this where the scooter belongs. Is it gonna be down in the bikeway with the bikes or up on the pedestrian sidewalk? Uh, or are we gonna have signs all over the place? I should also mention that I'm an old guy. Pat Shepard will tell you, I'll remember back to the 1890s when, when the bicycles had control of the roads because there weren't any cars. Uh, so I think that's where we're headed here is to a time when the cars take second fiddle to the bicycles. But at the same time, I think we're looking at you guys in DOT are pushing the bicycles out of the way to get the scooters in. Uh, what, what are we doing about scooters, Matt? Uh, thanks for that comment, Mel. Um, uh, scooters uh, should ride in the bike lane. We, we call it a bike lane, um, but really that's where scooters uh, should be if there is a bike lane, although they are, um, I don't know that the state law is, says they're required to use them, um, but, I, but in power mode, I believe they're not permitted to be used on the sidewalks um, in, in Montgomery County. I believe that's how the, the rules are. And, but uh, the, the, we would expect the scooters to use the, the cycle track on Simon Street. Um, next up, we have uh, Garrett Hennigan. Garrett, you should be able to unmute yourself now.
Uh, we're we're not hearing you, Garrett. We're getting some interference. Can you uh, try again? Are you there, Garrett? How's this? A uh, much better. Okay, great. Um, so I'll try to keep this quick. Um, uh, Garrett Hennigan from the Washington Area Bicycles Association. Um, first and foremost, I just wanted to thank you all for for bringing this project forward, you know, and doing it right. Um, really grateful that MCDOT has invested the time and resources to bring such a high quality project um, that, that's really trying to understand the the sort of unique uh, context of Fenton Street. Um, I'll I'll start off as, as others have on um, the 410 intersection. This design looks fantastic. Uh, the slip lanes, you know, create a completely unnecessary speeding condition that's just bad for everybody, whether you're driving, walking, biking. Um, it's just, uh, uh, your, your design looks fantastic. Um, and whenever that can move forward, uh, will be um, perfect. Um, turning to the Fenton Bikeway study, uh, you know, I, I want to celebrate for a moment that every single one of the alternatives that you all have brought forward um, envisions a, a low stress bicycle connection that that completes a critical link in Silver Springs low stress bike network. Um, you know, this will help get people to work. It'll help get customers um, and also employees to Fenton Street businesses um, and to elsewhere in downtown Silver Spring. Um, th this is gonna be a really helpful link for anybody who's trying to travel um, in Silver Spring and also give them a really good option that doesn't include a car um, if that's something they're interested in. Um, also, just from what I've heard uh, uh, 15 or 20 years ago, um, this process that you all are doing right now is is far more open and participatory um, than the last time M MC Dot was, was working on Fenton Street. Um, and th this isn't a particularly quick study. I, I think you all should be really proud of the process you've run so far. Um, so just thank you for that. Uh, and I think the, the results will speak for themselves. Um, Getting to the design specifically, I, I wanted to call out a few elements that I really, really love. Um, this uh, intersection improvements, which, which is are pretty similar across all the alternatives. Um, this is not just, these are not just great for people on bikes, but also um, especially pedestrians. Um, this is gonna make those intersections far more intuitive for people to sort of safely get across, um, but especially safe. Uh, if, if this type of design uh, were carried out across all of Montgomery County's downtown urban cores, uh, I think we'd be in great shape, um, especially on the, the road to Vision Zero um, and, and elim eliminating uh, pedestrian and, and, and other road fatalities. Uh, I really love the loading zones on every block. I think that's critical. Um, I appreciate you've been speaking with business owners and I'm sure that that's uh, something they've been asking for. Uh, we should keep, try to keep that in whatever design moves forward. Um, and I'll just echo what some others have said. Uh, I, I'm a little bit hesitant to support any road widening. Um, I understand the reasons behind it in trying to keep uh, some of the other, you know, elements of the road that people like, like, you know, driving lanes or parking lanes. Um, but I, I think it's important to note that how important that space is for pedestrians um, and for the, the environment that we create for those pedestrians that are so, that we know are so critical to, to keeping the businesses and keeping the life and vitality of that area. Um, not outright opposed to them, but I definitely hesitant um, also because the costs increase. Um, uh, WABA will we, we'll get uh, more specific preferences on, on which alternative to you before the deadline. Um, but just wanted to, again, echo, thank you, truly. Any of these would be a huge win for a more walkable, bikeable, uh, livable Fenton Street. Um, thanks so much. Uh, thank you very much for those comments, uh, uh, Garrett. Uh, we have, uh, by my count, we have four people with their hands up. We have about five minutes left. I just want to make sure everyone's clear. We're not going to cut you off. If we go past nine, we'll, we'll, we're willing to stay a little bit late. But if you could keep your comments brief going forward, that would help us get out of here uh, close to on time. And if you have not raised your hand and you have a comment, now is the time to raise your hand. Uh, Gordon C., uh, you're up next. Hey, everyone. Thank you. My name is Gordon Schaff, and I'm a reporter I lived my first four years in the DC area at the corner of Bonifant and Fenton in the Lofts 24 building. So uh, I'm excited to see this project move forward. Um, in terms of, regardless of the alternatives, can you talk for a second about what kind of uh, water, stormwater facilities that you can improve on uh, in, in the area or if those 
facilities are already pretty good quality in this corridor. Uh, yeah, we the I, I we we haven't gotten that far along in the design in terms of understanding exactly what kind of stormwater facilities are going to be possible. Um, but right now, there's very little on on site stormwater treatment in the corridor because this corridor is a very old corridor. It was built built in the time before we did we tried to do on site stormwater management. Um, so. What we want to do is incorporate best practices wherever possible. So there, there's going to be a bike, a barrier between the bikeway and the parking lane or, or roadway. So the question is, is it possible to put stormwater management in that space, or are we able to put it in the? If we're redoing the streetscape and maybe we have to remove some street trees, when we put the street trees back, is it possible to put that stormwater management in that green panel? Those are things that we're looking into. We really don't have an answer to that. I would say that there are some other examples around the country where uh, the buffer has been used for stormwater management. The uh, N Street cycle track in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska uses this. Uh, they have a, the stormwater management is in the buffer between the bikeway and the parking lane. Uh, in Oakland, California, the um, Lakeside cycle track, the Lakeside and Harrison cycle track has um, uh, has stormwater management in the green panel between the bikeway and the sidewalk. So there are some examples out there, but we want to try and incorporate those best practices and treat as much water on site as possible because it's critical to protecting our environment, including Sligo Creek, where a lot of this water ends up, um, and in the larger scheme of things, the Potomac River and the Chesapeake Bay. Um, uh, Karen Roper, I am unmuting you now. Go ahead, Karen. Hi, Matt. I want to thank you for considering all the businesses <clears throat> input, but there's a couple of things that I'm not clear on and I want to say. Did you resolve how the Safeway trucks are going to load in that underground lot? When they back out in these scenarios, looks like they're going to run over some bicycles. Uh, do you want to, is that your only question? Or no, I can, I can no. write them down. No, I also wanted to comment that I don't know if you studied neighborhood patterns, but any option that prevents a northbound uh, left turn on Thayer is going to put a lot of traffic on Grove because that's where the supermarket is. And a lot of people are coming from deep in the neighborhood to there and they're going to go up Grove to come back the other way if they can't turn left. I'd like to see the maximum parking for these businesses for many reasons. And I must have missed it, but is it clearly marked when I go back? Where are the loading spaces? Yeah, if you look at the plans, the loading zones are shown like with the maroon color. But I, I did point out that that just sort of the conceptual. We we want to put a placeholder on there to say we're definitely going to do loadings on on each block. But the exact locations is something that we can work out in the design process. Did you have any other questions, or should I start? Yeah, the Safeway, the Safeway tractor trailer that backs out and blocks the entire street. Yes, so we, we met with Safeway, uh, Steve, Steve and I met with Safeway a couple months ago, uh, and we were, we were there long enough to see that delivery happen, uh, to see a delivery happen. We talked to the manager and the assistant manager about how, how their loading needs are, and we, um, uh, we definitely want to try and incorporate the need, their needs in terms of, they do have some loading that happens on street. They don't all go to the loading dock, but you're right, for the big truck, um, that is a concern. Um, and we, we think that um, it's workable. The, the trucks are pretty slow when they go in and out. And um, it's something that we're going to have to work through more with the design. Do we, do we have any other treatments there that help protect cyclists? Um, it's, it's, it is a concern. And we will continue to work on that as we go through. So that's, that's a good point. In terms of your, uh, your question about the left turn bands, I, I agree that, you're, that um, any turn, bands like that could have the... Uh, the ability to change traffic patterns. So that's that's something that we um, are looking at as well. And this is just, this is a way that we were trying to look at how could we, on these blocks where we have a lot of small businesses, how could we have a lot more parking on those blocks? And the way to do that would be to not have a left turn lane, but in terms of trying to balance that. Well, safety, I was speaking, uh, Matt, just specifically the Thayer Avenue one. Right, so that's there's a lot of small businesses on- one from into the neighborhood. That's the only one I was thinking. Right, there's a lot of small businesses on that block, so that's why we look particularly at that block. That's alternative F that you're that, that has that that left turn ban. Um, so that's a good point, and I think it's a point that we will look more at as we go through the design process. So thank you, thank you for your comments, Karen, and thank you so much because I have to thank Karen because Karen.
put together the first meeting we had with business owners. Karen was instrumental in getting that meeting put together. So she really got the ball rolling on, on communicating with businesses. So thank you for all your, your hard work on that, Karen, and, and thank you for being involved. Um, Ray Heinzman, I'm lowering, uh, or I'm uh, unmuting you, Ray. Good evening, everybody. I'm Ray Heinzman. Um, I am a cyclist, a pedestrian, and a car driver as well. And, uh, you know, I own a business and, and own a house here in Silver Spring. And I really appreciate and am grateful for the improvements you guys have put all this effort into uh, coming up with, the design of it and everything. Um, but I do wonder if it doesn't go far enough and if there is any consideration for what is happening in other places as population density increases. Uh, other places in the world have uh, come up with things that are like car-free oasises, where there's areas of a city where cars just don't go. And I don't know that Fenton may be the one place in Silver Spring that that's appropriate, but Ellsworth was really nice for a while um, up, until be, you know, up until the cars were allowed back. And I think that a lot of businesses uh, can thrive in a place where uh, more people fit and cars aren't there. Uh, it's much safer and it's much easier and it's much quieter. Um, but if, you know, I just wanted to bring that up. That's all. Thank you very much for your presentation tonight. I really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you very much, Ray. Um, next up we have, uh, and this is, this is the last hand that I see right now. So if you, if you haven't raised your hand, uh, now is your last chance to raise your hand. Uh, so Britta Anderson, I'm going to unmute you now. Go ahead, Britta. Hi, thanks. I just have a quick question. I was wondering um, for the intersection with 410, if you have um, any thoughts on what, what the space where the high speed turn lanes will be used for. Um, we live right around there and want to, just are curious what, what will happen to that space. Uh, that's a great question, Britta. So uh, there are two spaces because there are two ramps. So on the northwest corner, um, uh, which is um, the corner that's adjacent to the Fenton Street Urban Park, uh, our, our hope is that we can work with the State Highway Administration to have that land either dedicated to or sold for a dollar or, or some nominal fee to the Montgomery County Parks Department uh, to use as an expansion of the Fenton Street Urban Park. So we are working with the Parks Department um, about maybe what the future of that space could be. Um, but some of that land is owned by the State Hi Highway Administration. So the, the county, the county right of way, I, I think we won't have any challenges. Tran, uh, transferring over, but the, uh, the State Highway Administration, we're gonna have to work with them on, on that as well. Uh, for the other corner, we really haven't um, looked a whole lot into what that's gonna be. It is kind of someone's front yard. So um, we need to work more closely with the homeowner about maybe what they uh, see that space becoming. But I don't think it'll become a park space uh, because we don't want necessarily to have gatherings right in, front, in someone's front yard exactly. But we, we do wanna work with the homeowners there to figure out what the best the best way forward is on that. Um, so, uh, we did have one, uh, question come in by, uh, chat. So I'm just going to read that out. It's from Dave Helms and he asks, uh, uh, has there been any ADA community input for these alternatives? Uh, and what impact do the alternatives have on that community? Uh, I will say that we are going to be talking with the Montgomery County Commission on people with disabilities, um, and the, uh, the Montgomery County, uh, Commission on Aging about these alternatives as we go through the process and we will involve them uh, during, the, during the entire design process, not just now, but going forward, um, 35 and 60, 90% design. Um, we have been working with the, those commissions uh, on other bike projects in the past. So we will re work, be working with them, but I will say that all of the alternatives, everything we do will be fully compliant with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, and it is our hope that wherever possible, we go above and beyond that uh, as much as possible. So we're trying and try and incorporate best practices that are above and beyond the bare minimums. That's our goal is not to just do the bare minimum, but really to make this um, maybe the most accessible place in Montgomery County. We really do want to look holistically at the streetscape. This is not just a bike project. It really is also about pedestrian safety. And the most, the most vulnerable road users are those people who have disabilities. So we really do want to make sure that they are safe and comfortable in this corridor as well. So that's a great question. Thank you for asking that, Dave. 
Uh, I should have brought this up earlier, um, but for those of you who are still here, uh, we have heard from PEPCO. PEPCO is getting ready to start resurfacing Fenton Street very soon. So that, that long period of construction that has been going on, I know has been very frustrating for those of you who live and work and recreate and bike in that corridor. Uh, that that uh, our, that work is, is very close to being done. So um, we're, uh, we're excited about that. And I think sometime this winter, they're gonna start resurfacing Grove. Um, and other than that, I do wanna apologize again for the uh, difficulties we had uh, during the presentation. Um, uh, I guess it's a fact of life in 2020 that we have to uh, deal with new kinds of disruptions. And uh, it is of course not our, uh, our hope that that happens, but we really do want to uh, work to get those, to make it those less likely going forward. And I appreciate your patience in dealing with those. So, Hey Matt. Yes. I got one last question in here. When, uh, when will the plan come to the planning board? Uh, we do not have a planning board date yet. I'm working with the planning staff now to get a date set up, but it's looking like potentially the end of January. So the, the last Thursday in January is the 28th. Um, so it might be that day, but we don't have a date yet. Um, but just keep your eyes peeled for um, the planning board calendar for the end of January or potentially early February. Um, so other than that, I just want to thank you all for taking the time. I know that there's a lot of stuff you could be doing uh, on your, uh, your Wednesday evening, and I appreciate that you took the time to come to a community meeting about this project. And I hope that I see all of you at future meetings, and hopefully one day we'll have an in-person meeting and I can see you in person at one of those meetings. I, I can't tell you how much it would be great to go out and have an in-person meeting one day soon. So thank you all. Stay safe. And uh, please remember that comments are due by December 4th. I encourage you to send those to me by email. Um, and we will uh, look forward to getting all those comments. Even if you spoke tonight, please uh, try and get those comments to us in writing. So thank you very much and have a great evening.